Welcome to Tell Us What You Made, the show where we each make one dish with one common ingredient or theme. Then get together, compare notes, and see if we can learn anything. This episode, Inka, Andrew, and I each made a different dish with an ingredient that I chose, which is ribeye. I chose ribeye because I love steak, and it is the cut of steak that I enjoy the most, but I think there's so many ways that you can cook it, and I was just excited to see how my friends are going to make it. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello. All right, Inka, you're first. Tell us what you made. I made japaguri <sighs> from the Academy Award winning Parasite. Reason I did this, reason I chose this recipe was because, well, you know, it's not the first time I've made japaguri, but I always wondered, you know, I want to channel that energy from Parasite, that wealthy family, never really been able to buy really expensive beef. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Liza, for allowing me to do this. And Thank you, yeah, Alvin. Made... <laughs> Thank you, Alvin, for choosing ribeye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Adam and Liza, for giving me permission to buy it. Just like sort of for some context, I believe in Parasite because it's in like South Korea, they used expensive Korean beef, which should be Hanwoo beef, which we cannot purchase here in the US. Mm. I tried to look for it. So instead I bought some A5 Miyazaki Wagyu. I had Hanwoo oh, beef Jesus. once. <gasps> How was it? It was crazy. <gasps> it was wild. Mm. Ugh. And yeah, I, mean, I, was, I was in Korea. It was the only time I've ever been to Korea. It was like one day. We were filming a Worth It episode in Korea on barbecue. Yeah, we had a chance to try Hanwu. It was crazy. It's very similar to Wagyu, and it, it's that very evenly and richly marbled beef. Dang, okay. Because I was trying to look at comparisons, but supposedly they're both kind of like very buttery, fatty, so I thought this was the closest I could get to it. But you see it already, the beef right there. I literally was at the butcher shop slacking Liza. I was like, Liza, they have two different cuts here. One is like one quarter of the price of the other one, but can I get the more expensive one? And Wait, I got I, permission. I can't make out that number. It was like 150 something for oh one my slice. God. Yeah, and what's the poundage yeah. on that? 1.10 pounds? I think so. It, you see how like white it is? It's all then marbling. It's like more fat than actual meat, I feel. Marvelous marbling, as we say. Literally sliced like butter. It's like butter. And Dang. that's like, I saved that chunk for later for like other purposes. But as you can see, it's like very easy to cut through. It's like cutting cold butter from the fridge, right? Wow. I mean, Oof. here I'm just cutting the slice of meat into cubes, which is probably not the best way to enjoy the flavor of this beautiful piece of steak in its purest form, but that's kind of the whole point of this recipe. So I am not worrying about cutting it against the grain or anything like that. I am just cutting it into cubes the way it's done in the movie. Very satisfying shape. Right. And then I just season them very lightly, very, very lightly, since there's going to be a lot more sauce later on in the ramen packets. That's kind of what I did to start it off. This is probably totally unnecessary, but I just wanted to smell the Wagyu beef flavor. So I just oiled it up a little bit in my pan and then I just pan fried these, seared them essentially to get that like golden brown color. This was so satisfying, honestly, oh so satisfying. It's so like little oh. perfect cubes. Oh, wow. Just rendering in its own fat and <laughs> oh my god just to get that beautiful golden brown crust on the outside and then i started cooking the ramen and the neoguri package is actually from korea so my friend sent it to me from korea there's this like little piece of black thing that fell out first and i was like what is that it's kombu it's just seaweed oh. i think mm. the ones in korea are like the fancier versions we don't have them over here essentially the step is just right cooking both of the noodle packets and the little dried veggies over there. Chapaguri is very indulgent, right? It's essentially just like noodles and beef. There's no vegetable other than the dried vegetables that come with the packet. So I didn't try to make this healthier. I just went straight for it. So I cooked the noodles until they were softened and then I just drained them. Did not rinse them this time because I kind of wanted that like starchy water clinging to the noodles in the same pan with all that beef fat. I just tossed in the noodles there. There's also like little bits of seaweed there. And then I just gave it a good toss to coat it in the oil. That's when I added in the seasoning powder, both of them. Why do you use both the 
Nioguri and the Chapagetti? So what do they do? Because Japaguri is essentially both of them. It's both of the flavors, the Nioguri flavor and the Japagetti. So Japagetti is right, Jajangmyeon flavor, right? Nioguri is more like seafood broth based flavor. And the the thing with this one is that I actually didn't add full packets of both of them because then my sodium level would have been like phew. Um, but I added <laughs> all of the Japagetti one and then like half of the Nioguri one. So then, you know, trying to control that salty level there. Um, but yeah, Japaguri is essentially mixing both of these flavors and they actually surprisingly go together really well. And then I added, you know, the remaining noodle water in there to get it extra saucy, like cooking pasta. And then... Ooh. All right, give it a good toss. Make sure it's all coated. You get that wow. shine. Around then is when I added in the beef. This is honestly like, it's like the juxtaposition, right? Of like, just like really expensive beef versus like $1 noodle packets. Yeah. That's, that's the beauty. It kind of represents the movie in a way, right? Exactly, exactly. It's like two worlds colliding. I just never had the luxury to do that until now. And so I thought, you know, I have to add in a little bit of truffle oil to finish it off, to get oh. it extra shiny. Because oh, Japagetti, no. usually you add in oil at the very end to give it that like extra shine. So stepping it up a little bit. You see that? Oh my God, did you see what I did? I tossed the oil aside. That's what I did. <laughs> you guys, that's, that's pretty much it. I didn't want to add anything extra. I wanted to really taste the Wagyu flavor with the seasoning packets really loaded it up was very generous with the beef as you can tell and then i just wow i'm like actually like salivating you guys it was look at it oh i added some sesame seeds i ate it all up and it was so good each bite was just coated in that like beef fat which added so much umami flavor it was wow really good. so that was my uh, my ribeye dish. A very, I was gonna say accessible, but I guess not because of the beef, but otherwise accessible dish. It's like if you took the price of both and just moved the decimal point, it would be equal, right? It's probably like, you know, one to two dollars yeah. for the noodle packet. It is exactly what the movie is about. How, because it's like so such expensive beef versus like japaguri is something I think that is commonly known for like, you know, like college students and like people just eat casually at convenience stores. I think I would have also been happy just like eating it with like a nice piece of ribeye, you know? Where's mine? It's your episode, Alvin. You could have done it. I'm sure you have something amazing coming up too. It didn't cost $143. <laughs> I didn't say anything throughout the whole thing. Cause I was like one half side, I was just so jealous. The other half was just speechless. I was like, oh my God. I can't tell if I should be angry or overjoyed, but that was great. I really like that you went and you, you did what they did from Parasite. Not only did you bake Chopper Grill, you did what they try to do in the movie. And I think that that was what was really cool to see someone actually doing it like that. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you for choosing Rib High. All right. So moving on, um, Andrew, you're up next. Tell us what you made. I made a bone-in ribeye on a charcoal grill, which is something I've never Ooh. done before. Ooh, charcoal Ooh. grill, okay. Yeah. I made ribeye before on my stovetop in, in like a heavy steel pan, but I've never done it over a grill of any kind really, but especially like a charcoal grill with lump charcoal. It's more of that like natural cooking thing. And I wanted to try it out. I was at this butcher store. It's this place called Gwen that we filmed with for Worth It Before. And I've used their stuff in various videos. I've bought like butcher stock from them and stuff like that. Here's my opinion on steak, which I've only recently realized about myself is that when, when I really think about what I desire from a really great steak, it's really just the taste of fat and salt. And like all the meat, I can sort of take it or leave it. In addition to making the ribeye, I saw that they had this bone marrow there. So I got a couple of those, which I'm also going to make on the grill and Oof. eat with just a little bit of salt and parsley, which is how it's served at this restaurant I've been to in London called St. John. Here's the actual ribeye. This is an 80 day mm. dry aged bone in ribeye. They do the dry aging themselves there at Gwen. You can see it's very thick. And I think the price of this was very similar to yours, Inca. But this oh, was like dang. well over two pounds, I think. 
It's an impressive piece of meat. It's a big old meat lollipop. So I salted it and I let it sit in that salt for a good long time. And then here's my charcoal that's now white hot. And I opted to get some like, you know, natural lump Ooh. charcoal. Also, the beauty of cooking outside is the glorious sunlight hitting your meat. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> Are you just holding it in front of yeah. the camera? Like... Yeah. I wonder, I'm, what, did I'm, your, what did your neighbors? <laughs> I don't know if anybody saw, but. It's like a caveman. I feel like if you see somebody do that, you know what they're experiencing. <laughs> the challenge I realized with cooking over an open heat source, which is what charcoal is, right? Essentially cooking over a flame, is that as the fat on the steak renders, it's going to drip down and cause these mm. flare ups. It's not good. It's gonna make the steak cook unevenly. It's essentially fat burning too. So you're getting like burnt fat flavor all over everything. So my charcoal is off to one side and I'm, you can see I'm using my tongs to just rotate the whole grate on and off to sort of keep the ribeye in the hot zone, but avoid flare ups as much as possible. But it's very difficult actually. Yeah, it's like, how do you even know when, how to cook it, how long, and like how to control the temperature of the, the charcoal? I mean, that's the thing, I don't. <laughs> that, that was part of the experiment for me is just like, okay, I have this pile of hot charcoal and I have this big piece of meat and I'm gonna figure it out. I'm gonna do it by feel. Because I was gonna say it's such a thick cut of meat because when I was a kid, when we barbecued in Hong Kong, we, we all did it over open charcoal and like, yeah. it's always been like the hardest thing. What you were saying about the oil dripping down. But like for us, it's like maybe like a baby wing, you know, but like this is like an entire piece of steak. So I'm just like very curious to see how it pans out. Yeah, I don't know if this is a good method necessarily. Oh, you can see here I'm adding more charcoal as time goes by because this took like a while to cook. Mm. Oh man, oh wow. man. Oh, and so the other good thing about having it bone in is that you have this built-in handle to <laughs> move the meat around. I, I found that very useful. Oh, and hopefully Lord. you can see the surface there is just like sizzling as I'm moving it into the hot zone and like getting that hard caramelization and then moving it off. It's just like the whole surface is just fizzling with <laughs> bubbling fat. And then for a period of time, I moved it onto the other side of the grill, not over the charcoal, and used the lid to help cook it all the way through. And the thing that I've noticed about steaks, you know, I don't cook steak that often, but when I do, I try to get something that's a little bit nicer from a place like Gwen, where it's like meat that's been responsibly sourced, it's been handled well. And also when you, make that extra effort to get a nice piece of meat and it has a lot of additional marbled fat throughout it, it's a lot more forgiving in the cooking process. Mm. And like, you don't necessarily have to nail an exact internal temperature or like get it super rare because it'll still taste great. That's very true. And so yeah, I'm, I'm honestly just kind of like fiddling with it for a long time. I took this opportunity to, like I said, try making a ribeye by feel. And I wanted to try out this other technique that I've seen done at restaurants. And it's something that my brother, who's a professional chef has shown me. This is a little metal cake tester that I'm inserting into the side of the ribeye. I'm trying to get it into as close to the center as possible. And basically you just insert this thin piece of metal. And so if you keep it in the meat for a couple moments and then you pull it out and immediately feel that tip, you'll get a sense of what the temperature is inside of the meat. If you're cooking a rare steak, you wanna like stop cooking it around like 120 or something like that. So if you consider what your body temperature is, it's only gonna be like a little bit warmer than that where you can guess that you're getting close to the end of the cooking process. You wanna to touch it to like a sensitive area of skin without being weird, you know, like you don't wanna use your calloused fingers that might be like numb from touching a burning hot uh, ribeye bone. <laughs> so I, you know, I touched it to like my forearm or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then because I'm a wuss, I also used a thermometer. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait, all this talk about that method and then. I... Well, I, I wanted to have like a reference point. I wanted to say like, okay, I'm going to try it out with this and then I'm going to like actually see what that temperature is. Yeah. Uh... 
And here's the bone marrow. It's basically all fat in there, so it's gonna start becoming very loose and dripping almost immediately. So it was only face down on the grill for like less than a minute. Mm -hmm. And then I flipped it over and just allowed it to like uh, heat up entirely. I feel like I can almost smell it. And as it's dripping, you can see the charcoal is just like spitting with all that fat that's dripping on it. And so yeah, there's this restaurant in London that's famous for serving bone marrow, where it's served with like a little parsley salad and salt and bread. So that's how I ate it, by just taking a little knife, scooping it onto the bread. It's mainly just about this taste of the fat and the salt. And to be honest with you guys, like I could just eat this and like leave the ribeye. Oh good, great, I'll pick it up. Well, now it's time to slice. Let's see, let's see. So first I remove it from the bone, if I'm remembering correctly. You might recognize that knife. Yeah, I was about mm. to say. The ribeye is, is actually that part that I'm more, more closely gripping with my left hand. And I forget what this part's called, but there's like the area around the ribeye. Ribeye cap? That, yeah, yes. rib, ribeye cap, yeah. You're holding the eye. It's the eye, eye in the cap, but yes, Inka's correct. Ah, thank you. There's the cap and I just, Slice this into chunks. Speaking of delicious fat flavor, the cap is where it's at. I think that's the best part. And so here I'm just trying to figure out where the hell the grain is and to slice my ribeye. And I think I immediately put that piece in my mouth. Classic. I feel like it's real hard not to do that when you're slicing steak. Oh or yeah. How? That's the chef's treat. The sun had set at this point, so I know that this meat looks just gray, but I promise that it was not. The nature of the way that I cooked it, it was never going to have that super contrast between perfectly medium rare and the crust on the outside. But I also think that that's okay. I think kind of hyper focus on getting perfectly rare inside is a little overrated to me. The most important part is that rendered fat flavor mm. in combination with salt. It doesn't have that much of a smoke flavor. I don't think there's that much opportunity for smoke to impart itself on this meat. But there's a little bit of that, there's a lot of fat, and so I ate it with a little chimichurri on the side, which is, you know, very herbaceous, garlicky, vinegary. That was pretty much it. Like, what about the bone? Did you just like, <laughs> I'm just like envisioning like that bone still there, is there still meat on there? I would have wanted to Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of uh, extra little bits that I put into Ziploc bags and put into my freezer oh. to make Fried rice at will. Oh my gosh. I'm also just very impressed that like, you said you've never done it before. Like I feel like if I had done it on like charcoal, I would have either overcooked the meat or burnt the meat or you know, I think this is like super impressive. I was definitely freaking out at one point, just like, I think I'm destroying this thing. Well, it came out great. Anyway, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Liza, for giving me this opportunity to <laughs> cook a very expensive steak. Last but not least, Alvin, tell us what you made. I made a hand chopped ribeye burger. Ooh, exciting. I love steak. And as someone who loves steak, if I get a really, really nice steak, I am definitely treating it similar to the way you did, Andrew, giving it just some salt, some pepper, grilling it, and eating it like a steak. But sometimes there might not be that available, or you know, maybe people don't have a butcher shop that sells prime, and this is the kind of ribeye that you might get at a store. And there's nothing wrong with this kind of steak, but I think I wanted to try to see if I could take a steak with maybe less marbling and more maybe big chunks of fat that might not be as enjoyable to me as a well-marbled steak, and see if I could give it a treatment and still make it almost that experience. So essentially what I did is that I took a ribeye, and I chilled it and froze it a little bit so it's easier to cut and slice. There's big hunks of fat, there's big hunks of meat, but there's not a lot of marbling. And I like the idea of chopping this by hand and making the pieces small. So you're almost re-marbleizing the mixture, if that makes sense. You're cutting all the pieces very small so that when you mix it up, the fat and the meat are now a little bit more evenly dispersed rather than if you eat it like a steak you're going to toss out all the fat and you're going to end up with very lean meat oh so interesting yeah so that was the idea and it kind of looks like pancetta which is kind of interesting and these are very very rough chops but i'm just literally hand chopping with a knife there's no blending there's no grinding the heat of your hand the heat of everything starts to make it look like ground beef 
How long did it take you? Uh, 30 minutes. minutes not not bad. Probably, yeah, 15 minutes if I had your knife. But this mixture is very, it's very coarse. It's very loose. And I wanted to keep it that way because I didn't want it to have the texture of normal ground beef. I kind of wanted to see if I can make a steak-like burger. I think that was also what was really interesting to me. And instead of seasoning the mixture itself, which can pull out water and start making things fine, I'm actually seasoning the parchment paper where I'm going to make the patties on. So oh. these are these are quite big. These are not a smash burger. Usually I like to make those kinds of burgers, but this one is a steak-like burger. So it's quite thick. So this is my steak patty. Oh, yeah. And yeah, this is, that's a burger. That's nice and thick. When, when I like to make burgers, I toast the buns first. So I put butter in the pan and I toast the buns at a very low heat. These are just some nice brioche buns and looking for a nice, even crust. I think the key to toasting buns for me is actually lower and slower rather than like you see the top. I think with burgers that are this big, you do need buns that can hold up to that weight. So I think the longer I toast them, the more they get a, a structure to it. And yeah, in goes the patty. Slightly pressing it down with a spoon to make contact with the pan. And I basically, I'm cooking this like a steak. I'm seasoning it only on the outsides with salt and pepper, basically when the cooking starts. And I'm trying to almost take all the fat that is coming off of the steak and push it back down to get it as much of a crust as possible underneath. And for the flip, yeah, exactly like how I'd cook a steak. Is there a reason why you used that pan and not your cast iron? I could not find my cast iron for this pan for some reason. <laughs> so I decided to go with a nonstick with no fat. But yes, if you're at home, please do use the cast iron. And then for cheese, I know it sounds weird, but I like to use American cheese. I think for burgers, it's one of the few cases where it makes sense. It's almost seasoning the burger and it melts very differently than normal cheese. It, I know, you know, putting Kraft or American cheese on an expensive ribeye might sound weird, but I love American cheese for burgers. And yeah, just goes on. Boom. A couple of pickles. It's a lot of fat, a lot of beef fat. Three pickles. And I made a little special burger sauce. It's very ketchup, mayo, mustard, smoked paprika, garlic powder. There's recipes online for it. I just like to have a burger sauce recipe. That's pretty much it. That's burger. Boom. Yeah, this is like a bistro burger. That like, you know, thick format burger. Yeah, and the goal actually is to cook it to medium rare in the center, which I might have gone a little under on this one, but you can still see there's a lot of texture in there with like the chunks of the beef rather than all ground up and being pebbly. I kind of like that it had a more of a meaty mouthfeel to this one. Yeah, look That's at that hilarious. bottom bun just like struggling under the weight of the burger. <laughs> yeah, and I toasted it on both sides, so I thought it was gonna hold up, but yeah. It's like when burgers get all the juice and all the fat, that bottom bun just like turns into like a thin layer of just like flavor pancake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wanting to eat that right now. Yeah, a little little different approach for this one than uh, the stuff that you guys made, but I don't know if it's worth the effort, to be honest. It's a lot of work for something that is still quite similar just to a really, really good burger, but it was a cool experiment, I will say. Look good. I want to try that now. I want to try yours. <laughs> okay, so that was our ribeye episode. We had Inca's chapoguri. We had Andrew's grilled ribeye with bone marrow and my hand chopped ribeye burger. Have you made a ribeye recently that you guys loved? If so, tell us what you made. 